Well, I welcome everyone here today. It was, uh, weren't so sure we were going to have it yesterday with the ice all over everything, and uh, I think that's uh, cut into our usual crowd. But we're going to have a great time today. This was going to be our quarterly, and uh, uh, so we're usually very informal, but with the quarterlies we do ha uh, have to do our Pledge of Allegiance, so if we'll all stand, we'll do that, and then we'll get started. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we do have, uh, we do want to mention, we have a, a few items that's left over from our September program that are for sale. We have the uh, videos of the ball team back there, and they're ten dollars. And we have uh, uh, the eleven by fourteen photo. There's uh, one left here at uh, fifteen dollars, and that's just that's what we paid French's to produce them. But we're just clearing it out. And then the ones that uh, have the signatures are twenty dollars. Um, We've got a, a couple of guests that's going to talk to us today. Emily Wilcox has uh, brought all the things that she has saved from uh, 57. She followed that team everywhere they went and everything that they did. And she's going to tell us all about that year and about the uh, uh, parade and about the trip and the things that happened coming down back home from Champagne after winning. And uh, also uh, Beverly Griffith has brought her scrapbooks and she's going to... Uh, give a, a few of her memories and she's donated the two trifolds back there to the uh, Heron Historical Society and uh, she fixed that up when we had our September meeting. Uh, normally we go through some procedures. Um, I think we're just going to kind of dismiss those and if that's okay with everyone unless you want to read through everything we'll just go ahead and get started. So I'm going to introduce uh, Emily Wilcox and uh, she's going to uh, tell us everything that went on that year. This isn't like the one we had in September. That was all about the team. This is what went on extra that some of you may not even know anything about. There was a lot went on besides the ball team and twin, but that was the main thing. <laughs> I brought this along. I've had a toe operation and I may have to sit down in a few minutes. Well, <clears throat> long about this time, every year there's a strange disease that starts all over our country and especially in the Midwest. It's called March Madness. And you know what that is. When the tournaments start, March Madness starts until the state tournament is over. And uh, there's never been a time that it was any crazier than it was in 1957. And actually, all throughout the decades of the 50s. I've been north, south, east, west, all the way to the coast. I've been to Disney World four or five times. I've seen all the beautiful parks in the country almost, historical places, all those things, and nothing, nothing was exhilarating or as exciting to me as that one weekend in Champaign. We just had a great time, and winning was what made it so, of course. <clears throat> We've been Tiger fans for a long, long time. And we still follow them on the radio. We can't uh, go to the games anymore. Most of you know my husband's in a wheelchair and blind, and I can't get around very well, so we do stay up with them. Though. Basketball had always been my favorite sport in school. Um, 
about my son, my grandson, and my great grandsons and Heron chose football or wrestling, but I did have a one grandson that played three years on the Marion team, varsity. And I had an awful time cheering for Marion. <laughs> <clears throat> I could cheer for him but not for Marion. I was before I transferred to Heron High School, I was a varsity cheerleader for a couple of years. And my <coughs> sister's boyfriend, who was later my brother-in-law, was captain of the basketball team, and we went constantly, and so it was sort of in my blood. And after my husband and I returned to Heron, after World War II was over, we didn't miss very many games, except when we didn't have the funds to go, <laughs> or we were uh, without a sitter when the children were very little, but most of the time they went with us, or if there was somebody sick, as a good thing. So uh, we have a lot of going to those. So you can see why we wanted to go to the state tournament. How many went, was, went to the state tournament this year? No. And Gail. Okay. Um, there are a lot of younger ones, and of course, my son was only in the eighth grade. That's been a few years ago, a whole 56 years. And, uh, I wanted to tell you about the displays. <clears throat> I think Philip and Melma for displaying the ones that were at the Civic Center. <coughs> my pictures have all turned yellow from age, and uh, they're not displayed very well. It's just my keepsakes from that time. But So after we had made arrangements, we had to get tickets. And that was the big thing, getting tickets before you went. I have here the ticket distribution thing that Mr. Eckert set up on Thursday night before the tournament. You had to go up there and wait for the drawing, hope you got one, two, whatever. And uh, there were only 585 tickets for us because we were one of the smaller schools. <clears throat> this isn't of too much information, but just to tell you, after they made the distribution, the general public only got 144, so it was a uh, a difficult time. If you didn't get drawn, you might have had to talk somebody else out of theirs. But we we were fortunate. We got two tickets, and our son got a student ticket. Although he was just in the eighth grade. <clears throat> but I want to tell you a little bit about our experience when we went up there. Some, and some of the things that took place, and some you might not have known, or some you may have forgotten. We planned to get a motel after we got up there, but we got fooled. There was none to be had. And so we slept in the car. <coughs> Pardon me. And it did turn cold. <laughs> and all I had was a spring coat. <coughs> And, uh, but we weren't the only ones. They were sleeping in cars all around us. Uh, I think my husband kind of had a premonition that we might not get a motel room because he'd fixed a wooden platform between the seats of the car and our son slept there and we, we sat upright all night, but we slept some. And it, I'm not even sure we had blankets with us, but we didn't get as cold back there as we do now. Uh, next morning, we after we won on Friday night, we had to go to the armory and they were getting the tickets for distribution for the rest of the tournament. We ran, I think it was a quarter of a mile, it probably wasn't, but it seemed like it, to get in line to get tickets. And then I lost a shoe on the way. I just had slip-on shoes and one of them came off and I had to go back and get it. And Frank and Jack Snyder were in front of us in line and we were talking about the cold 
And I said, it was so cold that one of, one of my uh, moisturizers, Lanolin Plus, froze last night. <laughs> and of course, they teased me for a long time. I didn't know your Lanolin would freeze. <laughs> and I, that went on for a good little while. Because we stood in line for over an hour to get to in. And then when we got up to the gate of the door to go into the armory, the surge came all at once, and I got knocked down onto the ground. But we finally got in and had to walk all the way to the end of the place to get the tickets. But we were fortunate again. We got two tickets and got our son one to watch the afternoon game. Edgar Fleener, I don't know if any of you remember him, his daughter Sandy, I bet you remember Sandy, don't you? Uh, was one of the cheerleaders. And he gave us his key to his motel room for us to go to freshen up in the afternoon and was that ever welcome. I'm not sure what we ate. I don't even remember going to a restaurant. We must have lived on the excitement, but I never go anywhere that I don't take a thermos of coffee and a, uh, snacks along in the car, so um, we didn't go hungry, that's for sure. When uh, 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 the game and the winning on Saturday night was one of the most thrilling things, and there was such yelling and celebrating as everybody came out of the gym that night, it was wild. We drove south of Champagne to uh, uh, get a motel, and uh, when we woke up the next morning, went down the lobby, there were already some other caring people getting ready. We went back to Champaign to join in the parade on Sunday, coming south. We wore the horn out on our fairly new car and had to have it replaced. <laughs> and as we drove around, I guess it was Route 45 and 37, then they got over to 148 to come on in to Heron. There was uh, waves from people all along the way as we go through those little towns. They were so excited for us, I guess. There were some rear end bumps in the parade, too. And I'll tell you, we were worried about the trophy all the way home. And I'll tell you more about that later. At Ziegler, of course, we were cut off with the police and all the local fans that had come up there. And we didn't know what went on after that. We were back in behind, and they, we had heard that they were taking a team and the coaches on a tour of Johnson City and Marion Carterville back to the high school. But we don't know if they ever made that or not. It was such pandemonium, of course, and we like to never got through the crowd to the hospital, to the hospital, <laughs> to the high school. <laughs> I was almost ready for the hospital uh, in order to uh, meet with them, where there were several that spoke, of course, at the welcome home celebration. Leon, my husband, went back in 1958. And I think Jack went 58 and 59. Did any of you get to go any of the other times? Did you go back again there? Uh, I knew personally some of them on the team. And um, of course, you don't have to know anybody personally because you feel like you know them after you watch them play for so long. I was working with uh, sophomores and juniors at our church at that time. <clears throat> that was the 15, 16 year olds, and Bart Lindsay and Steve Hurd were enrolled in our department. We had 80, and they were among them that were enrolled in that group. Um, Ken Dowdy, I knew his folks well. Who didn't know Ken Dowdy back in those? John Dowdy, his dad especially. Um, Kenneth Finney's mother had grown up with my mother, and I knew the family she grew up in. I didn't know John Tindall very well, but we knew Jerry real well, his brother. He was in Scouts <coughs> along with Jack, and there was a lot of parent participation, so we knew the Tindalls well. Sandy Matthews was our neighbor, and she and Gigi Van Soggy, who were cheerleaders, 
had been in my Girl Scout troop, so I knew them. And of course, uh, Sharon uh, Rushing, we've intermarried with her family and my family till we knew them very well too. I didn't know Coach Lee very well, but Bob Hutchison was a sophomore, I believe, when I was a senior. So I knew him, knew his family real well. But as I say, it didn't matter because you felt very close to the ones you saw play over and over. Everyone at that state tournament had a different experience, and I bet some of you could tell about your experience as well. I had several of these things and the memorabilia that I brought home, and you can see it's uh, not too new. <laughs> the 56 years has taken its toll. I've had those things in a big folder all these years, and I think I've been in it twice since then. Um, Got to remember that we went back in 58 and 59 also, and that was something for the schools who were not separated by class back then as for a size. That was something. Heron went to the state in 1919, and of course in 1940, Russ Emory uh, took his team to the state and we got beat in the finals by two points. So um, it was uh, something that hadn't happened in a few years. Uh, we were so sorry to hear about Earl Lee's death recently, as most of you know. I called Mary Ann Childers, Hudson now, to get her to come and speak, but they're in Florida. They were getting ready to leave, and she said, I would dearly have loved to come, but uh, of course, I can see why she wanted to go to Florida, too. Um, how many of you listened on TV or watched it on TV? Uh, some of you did that, that right. weren't there. Okay. Now, um, how many of you got to attend the one we had in September over at the Civic Center? Oh, there's more of you now. Uh, the uh, things that I have here on the table are in connection with the things that I'm going to be talking about at first. And on the table are the wins that we had in regionals and sectionals and super sectional. And then the winners and the cheerleaders from our, and then on the very end are those poor losers. And I felt sorry for them because I knew how much it meant to them too. I thought some of those cheerleaders from those other teams when they lose, think they were going to die, but they didn't. <laughs> <clears throat> so I told you about the distribution of tickets. The tickets were a dollar and a half. Now that sounds like an awful <coughs> low price for a state tournament. <coughs> but you got to remember that back then, five or six thousand dollars was a pretty good yearly salary. In fact, I knew some school teachers who were making $3,000 back then, so it wasn't cheap for that particular time. Then, oh, there was scalping going on, and the story is told of Frank Calper, who was the mayor of Culp. As he came out of the gym on Saturday afternoon, there was a little uh, boy that came up to him and uh, tried to sell him a ticket for the evening. $15. <laughs> and uh, Frank grabbed the little boy and he said, you better not do this or I'll put you in jail. He said, show me your badge. And of course, Mayor Caliper had a police badge and he opened his wallet. And the little boy was quite bug-eyed after that. And Lee, Coach Lee, with a dozen things to remember when he left town on Thursday, he forgot the gate passes for the boys. He got up there and realized it, so he called Ecker, Principal Ecker. He called Pete Truan. Some of you may remember Pete Truan. He's always synonymous from Johnson City with sports. And they took the gate passes up. And um, of course, Kabuti had quit coaching at Heron and was up at Champaign, and the whole Johnson City tribe that was kin to him was going up too, so he had two ways to send them up. 
uh, and Kabuti's wife couldn't even get off from work to see them in the afternoon when they played up there. Earl Lee had been the coach assistant for six years under Kabuti. And I think as we progress along in what I have to tell you later, you'll see the building blocks of making a winning team. And uh, Anyway, there was a lot going on up there. There was a circus going on for the um, students. 5,000 of them went there on Friday night. There was uh, all kinds of activities for them. They could watch the games if they didn't have a ticket on TV. And there was a, a dance after the Queen contest that night. It cost 25 cents to get into it. <laughs> And there was um, some other thing, a vaudeville show, and it was only 15 cents to get into it. The uh, thing that I wanted to tell you about it, this is a big lion's head that was at the entrance to the armory. There was five and a half miles of crepe paper that was strung from the big top. Did you go to that by chance, Gail? You didn't go to that. Uh, the, uh, they needed a place for the kids to hang out, you know. When their team wasn't playing, they were in the gym, of course. I have an article from the Champagne News Gazette. It tells about all those students being there. On, and then it said this mouth of this line as you walked in gave as big a roar as was going on in Huff Gym. So, they had a good time over there. But you'd be surprised. You know the thing that attracted them the most? They had all kinds of uh, battleship replicas, weapons in the armory, and the kids went wild about viewing those. Uh, the Navy and the Air Force opened up their doors because they saw such interest of the young people in there. And uh, that was everything they said from walkie-talkies to foxhole shovels. So uh, they had a good time with that. And here is the program, 25 cents. Where could you get a program today for less than three to five dollars? Probably not. The state of Illinois, here's little over here and way down here at the bottom. They didn't think we ought to have even scored up there. This is a very interesting book, and I didn't know when the state tournaments had started. They started in 1908, and uh, the whole story, and the first team that won it was from Peoria. There's a, the whole schedule that was in here of all the teams that played, and uh, so it's been a nice keepsake for us to have for that, too. The, Team stayed, not in the place where most of the teams stayed in town at the Inman Hotel. Coach Lee was wise. He took them out to the Illini Chief Motel where it was nice and quiet and so they could get rest. And, um, there was also something else going on. Over at the Army, there was the Queen Contest that uh, each team could put one of their cheerleaders in as a queen contestant. And Mary Ann was the, who's married to Ron Hudson now, was our contestant in that. Um, I wish she could have come. I know you would have loved to have heard what she had to tell too. Heron was the, <clears throat> the second smallest cool there. Uh, there was only one other, and that was the uh, Notre Dame of Quincy. They had 600 students, and we only had 690 at that time. Ottawa, who was there, 993. This is for comparison. Champaign, 1,000. Galesburg, 1,194. Collinsville, who we beat in the finals, 1,350. And Elgin only had the sophomore, junior, and seniors in their school, and they had uh, 1,400, so that would have been about equal to 2,000 if they had had all four years. And Evanston, who was in it, 
was 2,850. So you see what we were up against. And um, it was an honor to win against these larger schools. And uh, there's an article over there about how all the larger schools, of course, dominated it for years. Remember a, a little town by the name of Hebron that won it way back in 52? You remember that, Don? Mm -hmm. uh, and then Cobden went, uh, I don't know what year. 64, I believe. 64. They, they won second place, I think. The Collinsville and Galesville, Galesburg game was the roughest game that had ever been played that afternoon in the tournament as long as it had been in operation. After the game was over, um, one of the spectators ran out on the floor and uh, downed a Collinsville player and fans swarmed all over the floor, fights broke out on the floor and uh, the police finally got it under control and then they erupted again outside later but I think they restored order finally and somebody suffered an injured hand and we thought it was the Collinsville coach but we're not sure <laughs> because we didn't get up there until that evening for our game. And the Champagne paper kept calling Bob Hutchison, Bill Hutchison, and then in uh, some places they call him Hudson. So that old saying, don't believe everything you read in the papers. <laughs> That's so true. Coach Lee, you know, had three little girls, and he said he wanted to win a game for each one of them. And he named the trophy Sheila after his youngest one. So I guess. Uh, uh, I don't know if he named the other super sectional and the sectional trophies after Brendan Linda. <coughs> uh, one of his, were two of his daughters? And Linda the, and Debbie. Uh, Linda was the one brought him down, wasn't it? Uh, anyway, they were, uh, <coughs> pardon me. Les McCollum and Glenn Wittenberg had scouted the Elgin team before we went up there, they averaged 6-4. And everybody knew it was going to be a hard game that first night. But fortunately, we got through. Of course, John Tibble was on the Associated Press All-Tournament team, and Ivan Jefferson on the second team. Box, Galdoni, and Williams all received Associated Press votes. The Champagne Gazette also chose Tibble on the first team, but his scoring was not up to par in the championship game, but Box and the rest of them had higher scores to compensate. And that was what made them winners. They played as a team. And when one couldn't do it, another one could. And that's really the secret of winning teams. John Tibble had broken his arm when he was a freshman in football, and they didn't know if he's going to ever be able to play. But uh, he'd go to all the practices and sit up in the stands and watch everything that took place, and he was learning all that time. Willie Williams wasn't even eligible as a freshman, but Coach Lee spent an awful lot of time with him, teaching him math so that he could be eligible to play. And uh, Coach Lee said, when he, he wasn't done, uh, and he said, when Willie decided to make something of himself, he really went to town then. And of course, he was a fine player. But Tibble was, he could play forward, guard, and pivot man. And because of those three different positions, that helped a whole lot in the ring. And the coach said, too, that things that the fans didn't know is that Miller, Herb, Finney, Lindsey, Dowdy, and Hendricks beat the state champs, Heron, more than any other team. He was talking about in practice. He said they were fun-loving boys, and they liked to show the varsity up, and they often did. <laughs> so it was a fun thing for them, too. Several incidents also happened. Some of them were humorous and some of them weren't so humorous. In the string of cars on the way home from Champagne, 
there were these bumpers, you know, people bumping in the rear ends of each other. North of Mount Vernon, Walter Williamson, who worked for Brewster's, and L.D. Sterick, many of you remember him, uh, and Doc Tindall were all in a bumper collision. And uh, Lee had said that he wanted to bring the trophy home, but they were worried about how they were going to get it home. So we understood it was in Tindall's car, and we were not far behind, so that's why we worried all the way home that it was damaged. And I brought this up at the September thing. John Dimple didn't even know anything about it, but I guess he was uh, not aware, since it wasn't broken, that this had happened. And then on the parade back in this area, when we got down the hill, there were three people hurt. And I never knew who they were. Does anybody know who they might have been that were hurting that? bumper thing. Well, anyway, I guess they got a ride because it wasn't too much fun. Jimmy O'Donnell, he ran the Illinois Cafe, closed the cafe for remodeling. He wasn't had, having his mind on business anyway. He was one of the great fans. Glenn Whitburn's wife was all set to watch the semifinals on TV and the television tube blew up <laughs> so she couldn't watch it. And for, uh, the photographers, didn't have to uh, have any introduction to the number one clown or the one that was most photogenic. It was Grover Box, Richard Box's dad, up shaking his fist at the referees. And I have a picture of him over there clowning around. He was always uh, entertaining everybody doing that. And Principal Eckert didn't even get to go. He came down with a very bad cold, and some said they thought he succumbed to ticketitis, <laughs> and uh, he had to go to the doctor for the first time in years. And Tiger fans had many a laugh watching Ivan Jefferson dribble the length of the floor with the ball bouncing almost as high as his head. But I don't know if you knew about what happened. The Tigers finished with a different roster than they went up there with. Um, Kenneth Dowdy developed a knee problem, and that's why Coach Lee had taken John Hendricks along in case something happened. They said that Jerry Peck Miller was 18 years old, turned 18 on Friday, and everybody else aged without the benefit of a calendar from all the stress and all. Fans in the motor caravan moving south of Champaign on Sunday could tell when they got into basketball territory. Centralia coach Jimmy Evers had a carload of folks waving greetings at the Centralia Y for eternal. And Mount Vernon turned out they couldn't be greater welcoming and we were the ones who beat them badly in the super sectional. So, uh, that was nice of them to come after the meeting. And they said, Dr. Miller, do you remember Dr. Miller who used to be here? He had arranged to fly up to Champaign after he got through with his duties that day. And they grounded his plane, but they said he flew anyway in a Chevrolet. <laughs> so I mean, got there in time, I guess. And many of you might not have known, there was a wedding going on at the First Baptist Church that Saturday night. I was supposed to have been there, but they understood why I wasn't. And everybody was so concerned about the outcome, or oh, while well, the vows were being said. And so when the vows were over, they delayed the reception for quite a while, and all of them went in and turned the radio on, and they ate cake later. <laughs> so uh, they got to hear the final. Merle Jones, who was our longtime sports writer here, lost a bet on the game and had to ride a mule down Park Avenue. But I'm not sure if that was 57 or 58 or 59. Does anybody remember that? Jack told me about that. I the donkey know. wasn't a mule. Was it? Well, a mule was <laughs> Mule and the donkey are virtually the same. Aren't they? I think it was after 57. Was it after the 57? It was over West Frankfurt. He had to ride the mule down Good Lane. Day. Well, anyway, I, I guess that was a fun thing. Mm -hmm. uh, estimated crowd that 
greeted the Tigers was around 12,000, some say 10,000, but we'll leave it at 12,000 if that's okay. Uh, of course, many met there at the gym to uh, applaud and hear different speakers about this stunning victory for him. On Monday night, there was a crowd of 300 that attended a banquet, and uh, of course, uh, I think we have a picture of a large cake over there that they had, and they were lauded and praised by many of the organizations and the lodges in town. We didn't get to go to the banquet. Louise Hamilton, who used to be very active in our community, was in charge of the tickets, and she said she could have sold a thousand, but there wasn't room for them. So we didn't get to go because my husband had to go out of town on Monday morning at his job. I wanted to tell you just a bit about how the games differed. Uh, when uh, 1919 we came in fourth, and of course I told you about in 40, Russ Emery uh, was the coach then, and at that time it was the Sweet 16. It wasn't the Elite Eight that it later became. And uh, he said several things were different. The coach couldn't talk to his players at timeouts. Fred Camel, who was a floor leader back then, watched the coach's thumb, and if he wiggled it a certain way, they knew to change their defense to whichever way he wiggled it. That's kind of like the uh, signals in baseball, isn't it? Uh, and they jumped after every score back then, and the clock only stopped for fouls. And there were no three-pointer shots. Eckert said there wasn't as big a scramble for tickets back then, but I imagine the uh, economy had a lot to do with it. They, we were just coming out of the Depression then, and maybe that's the reason they didn't have so many going. Emory said that the kids broke down and cried, but he was too big to cry, so he did his best to console them. And I knew a couple of them that were on that 40 team real well, although uh, it was 42 when they were also Junior Newland and Leon Davis, and I can't imagine them crying, <laughs> but I guess when you lost, it was them. And I want to uh, just quickly review this decade of the 50s. I don't want to take up too much time because we want to hear from you. So that, like I said, so that you can see this building to this momentum. Uh, these, that whole decade of the 50s was the greatest years of March Madness that I've ever known in here. We've had some good teams since then and some very good individual players. And of course, like we say, the going up there in 2002, that, uh, then there was uh, Steve Fisher, who many of you know, and uh, he went on to be coach at Michigan, won the, what was it, the, uh, what was he? He won the whole. He won the whole thing. Whole thing. <laughs> Whatever the university is. Yes, he got all of them. And so we're talking about those. Small this is uh, the Queen contest. This is the um, uh, greeting. Uh, no, I believe this is the winning night. And we didn't have anything to make signs out of, so I took some stuff out of my husband's briefcase and made these signs. This was one of my saved. We had the plastered all over our cars so they know what we were honking about. And Jack has this. It's the uh, license thing that uh, with the yeah. Illinois 57 state champs here in Tigers. And this is a uh, was that from the circus? 58. The 58th circus. <clears throat> the uh, decade of the 50s started much different than the 40s had ended. If you remember, how many remember the high school burning of 1948? You were right across from it there, weren't Not you? Not then. I was, no, we were living out the heights, but I was five, and I, I remember that night there was a huge storm and lightning, and, oh. and then my parents taking me to see it. Yeah. Uh, that was the third high school that I'd seen destroyed in my four years. 
when uh, another area, south of here, where I, the school was condemned, and when I was a freshman, it had been there for years, and we had to go in a hall, two-story hall, but by my sophomore year, they had a new school built, and my junior year, some disgruntled taxpayers set it on fire, and I watched it go up in flames, and then to watch that that night was really a heartache. And um, so then by, you know, I, they went in churches and the buildings all over town here. And then by 1950, they were back in a restored school and a new gym that was, oh, of course, it was something, you know, having that uh, down in, what do you call that? Down in the, it wasn't on the same level to the that but a sunken facility, that's what I wanted to say. And of course it would be the site of a lot of changes in the next 10 years. Another thing that happened in 50 and 51, Russ Emery retired from coaching and became the Williamson County uh, Superintendent of Schools. They had a bad team, and as I call out some of these names, I know they'll bring some memories to you. The team members that year was Don Carr, Ron Mitchell, Carl Mitchell, Captain Kenny Ferguson, Jim Norton, Ron Yancey, Bill Donahue, Robert Knoll, Don Robinson, Paul Saxon, and Don Carr, of course, won the a valuable player in that year, but they were eliminated in the regional. I want to what point out that. Um, what year was that? That was in 50-51. Didn't one of those players <clears throat> wasn't he killed in the Korean War? Yes. Which one? Kenny Ferguson. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. I thought about that too. Yeah. I knew about that at the time he was killed. In 51-52 is when Leo Kabuti and early his assistant came to Heron, and things began to change. Um, they had a fairly young team again. Uh, there was Carl Mitchell, who was one of the best ones on the team. He averaged 23 points a game. And the Tigers won only 10 out of 15, but then in the last half, they really started picking up. And, uh, but they were eliminated in the regionals again. And on that team was um, both the Mitchell boys, Jack Burke, Robert Knoll, Mike Smith, Bill Donahue, and a fellow named Paul Restivo, <laughs> who would uh, later become the football coach and of course lead us in 27 straight football wins. And then uh, 52 and 53, uh, Kabuti was starting his second year, and he was basketball, football, and track coach. You know, they did all three back then. I don't they do well to do one, I don't think. And um, uh, Charlie Jack had given him a lot of responsibility. But Kabuti shared all of his philosophies with uh, Coach Lee and uh, Bob Hutchison, who was helping at that time, too. In 52 and 53, it was 16-10 for the best record there had been since 49. See how it's building? Ron Mitchell was named the most valuable player, and it marked the first time Heron ever won the Pyramid Tournament. And I want to tell you just a bit about the Pyramid Tournament. We have the lady here who named the Pyramid Tournament for this area. Melba won a prize of five dollars <laughs> which she named the Pyramid Train. It was started in 1950 and went on for 33 years and uh, she has kept this in a nice folder. We now have the Pyramid Plus Tournament and that would have been sometime in about 83 that it started. So we're glad of it. I think that was said she could have gotten a season ticket, but she didn't need it or didn't want it or something else. Well, they just didn't give it to me. Well, they just didn't <laughs> give it to you after you were supposed to have won it. Huh? Um, 
The underclassmen at that time included Carl Smith, Bill Lawrence, Jim Rankino, that's Cheryl's brother, Tom Thomas, and a freshman named Richard Jones. You know, Itchy. <laughs> Everybody knew Itchy Jones. He started as a freshman when all four years on the teams. But they lost in the regional again. Then in 53 and 54, uh, it was 9 and 3 in the South 7 Conference. The South 7 Conference was the hardest conference in the, almost in the state of Illinois to win because it had a lot of good teams in it. Uh, the nine, they won the conference nine to, no, they were second place that year. But it was the highest in the history of the school. Uh, they won the second time, the Pyramid Tour. Then the next, uh, Bill Lawrence, who had won, led the South Seven in scoring, averaged 20.5 points per game. Itchy Jones, a sophomore, named with Lawrence to the all-conference team. Then there was Ron Gray, who came back and was eventually a coach here. Carl Spitt and Jim Rankino, Cheryl uh, Trench's brother, he was a senior. He could shoot with either hand a shot that would go in. And um, then Smokey Jacobs, Tom Thomas, Junior Loveless, Joe DeWeese, Russ Duncan, Malachi Duncan, Floyd Hill, and Maurice Jefferson. I'm going to try to hurry this along. I'm talking too long here. I'll just try to skim over some of these other years. 54 and 55, they won the regional finally. And the pyramid tourney, tourney for the third year. Bill Lawrence was, won the conference scoring title for the second straight year and he was named All-Conference, All-Southern Illinois, and second team of the Chicago Daily News. He became, he became the first player to ever win both the football and the basketball Most Valuable Player Award. Ron Gray, Itchy Jones, and Tom Thomas contributed to that. And Charlie Hamilton, Jim McPherson, Joe DeWeese, Ron Hudson, <coughs> Ted Green, Bob Booth, Arlen Waldrop, and Jerry Margrace. And then they went to the sectional after they won the regional finale and got beat by all people, Shawnee Town. <laughs> that was kind of the whole By 55 or 56, I said Kabuti could have been elected mayor around here because he was so popular. The football teams were winning, the basketball teams were winning, and the best of the decade was still to come. Um, in 56, the Tigers won the South 7 Conference first, first place. See, we're building up to 57. There were three spine-tealing games with Pinckneyville. You know, Pinckneyville used to be our thorn in the flash almost. The Tigers won 51-50 during the regular season, only to have the Panthers and the 49 to 47 double overtime beat them in the sectional term. Tigers had senior guards Itchy Jones, Ron Gray. Jones was so good they retired his suit. Uh, Tibble had had his retired too, I should have said earlier. Other stars included Charles Hamilton. It says a senior, and they think, some of them believe, that he was one of the best all year round athletes that Heron ever produced. And most of you know Charlie Hamilton passed away just about a month or so ago. On the squad was a pair of juniors that played big roles, <coughs> Ivan Jefferson and John Tibble. Then we get to the 56-57 team, and I don't need to tell you the names of the first five. You've probably heard them a million times. Kabuti had molded the Heron Athletics into a winning machine in football and basketball, and he was gone. He resigned and went to Champaign, and of course, early he had become the coach. Kabuti would say later that he didn't expect the 57 teams, and they were good, but he sure didn't think they'd win the state tournament. So anyway, 
um, I'll not go over the list of the ones on the team, you know those. One of the keys to winning it had to be the fact that we had coached these kids since we were freshmen and sophomores, and so they were all very well attuned. And he moved Tibble from guard to forward. And they played much wider offense, and they played defense. It said like crazed, rabid dogs when they were fighting to get the ball. Early said at the end of the year, and of course, what I said long ago about the uh, the second team had played them very well through the season. Their best game was against Harrisburg. They scored a hundred points. It takes a lot of basket shooting to score that many. And the Tigers won the South 7 for the second straight year, and the Pyramid Tournament for the fifth year in a row. And then in the Heron sectional, old Pinkneyville, we handed them a loss for a change. And that was the last year that Duster Thomas coached for Pinkneyville. And of course, you know a lot about the rest of the story. Uh, they didn't win another sectional for seven years. <laughs> I guess that really took the wind out of the sails for me. And of course, we beat, we played Elgin on Friday night. This big team won. We played the small team of uh, uh, the one from yeah, you know, forgetting Quincy Notre Dame, the other small team. And it said Richard Box would lead Heron with 17. Galdoni popped in 10. Tidwell was held to just six points. That's all he scored that night. But that was the secret again of the winning. All that didn't matter. Heron had won, and early was the talk of Illinois. In 57 and 58, then, the Tigers had a tough act to follow. Tibble was gone. They had retired his jersey and he'd gone to Michigan University up there. Ivan Jefferson was in Wisconsin going to college. <coughs> but they still had Williams, Box, and Galdoni. The curve was that the Tigers had to find another head coach. And they offered Lee a raise, but as you know, he went up to the Metro East area and stayed up in that area. So they elevated Bob Hutchison to head coach and Glenn Whitburn and Les McCollum were his assistants. They went in 58. They didn't win a title, but they sure gave people a lot of excitement. And um, they were beaten in the quarterfinals by Chicago Marshall, who actually won the tournament final. And they won the sixth pyramid tournament in a row. And Richard Box was named to all conference, uh, all state team. Hutchison said after the West Frankfurt win that year that the Tigers would not be going to state. That was in the super sectional. Had it not been for their strong bench, I think we fail sometimes. We give the ones who are the big players all the glory, and we forget all of those that sit on the bench and stay there time after time after time, big things. Um, I'm going to skip down. Some others that were, uh, Ken Dowdy was back on the team that year. Charles Bona, Nick Grindle, Ray Kincaid, Dave Hill, Gerald Wharton, Terry Brandon, now I'm getting into some of uh, the more recent ones. And a skinny sophomore named Gene Turner. <laughs> and of course, we know about his record. Our journey's almost complete. 58 to 59, they would register a 31 and 2 losses, which is an unusual amount. And another trip to Champaign. Going up there three years in a row was very spectacular. And that was before the split class system that we have now. And Kim Daly was named first team on, at the tourney on the as the man. And Gene Charlie, he set a new single game scoring mark of 39 points, which would beat all records before. 
Um, some of them that year that were added were uh, Ed Whelan, James Williams, Doug Williams, Gary Hamilton, and Jim Cronago, Stanley Takis, and Ron Hudson. Uh, they won another Pyramid Trophy and another regional sectional. And now basketball at Heron High School was a religion, and everybody was converted to it as the years would go by. Um, the single class system now makes a whole lot of difference because you wonder what might have happened if we'd only been playing those that were equal to us in size. But they couldn't have gotten much better, could they? Uh, there were no three-point shots, and of course that would have added up. In the School Sports Hall of Fame, and I want you all this, I'm going to name some of them that are in the Hall of Fame, and some of you may know some more that are in there, and I'd like for you to call their names out if you do. In, um, of course, the 57 state champs were inducted into our Hall of Fame at the school in 87. In 88, Tibble and Bill Lawrence. In 89, Richard Box and Jim Galdoni. In 1990, it was Itchy Jones and Willie Williams. And Ken Dowdy followed in 91. Charles Hamilton was inducted in 92. And, uh, and Steve Fisher, who had most of his glory in the 60s, went in with super fan Jimmy Aldoni, another 50s product. 94 saw Lidio Kabuti, Gene Turney, and Jim McPherson. Clearly no era in Heron High School's history can match the 50s for basketball thrills, drama, and championship. And now I want you to talk. <laughs> uh, name some of the people that uh, you can think of just quickly, maybe on up to the present time. Call them out. You mean basketball players? Who? Basketball players? Uh-huh. Phil Steinmans. <coughs> Phil Steinmans. Okay. Yeah. Philip Hoppin. Philip Hoppin. Gary Rafe. Gary Rafe. Anybody else think of any? When you're trying to think of something, you can't think of again. <laughs> uh, Jack gave me a list. He took down some of them that are in the Hall of Fame at the school. Bill Green, back in 1974. Shane Gooden. Mike Gavin, Mike Chevetone, who is now deceased, Jim Miller, Brian Shillian, Brian Alge, Kyle Walker, Joe Hotsman, Mike Newbold, <coughs> Roger Jones. Anybody else that you can think of? I know there's a lot of other good ones too. I'm sure was Steve Fisher's not in there? Was it in there too? And so What's the point in talking when you don't have any more to say? So I'm turning it over to you. <laughs> I'm turning it over to those who <laughs> Well, I didn't know any of the players, but a couple of coaches, uh, Russell Emery was a relative. You were down in Texas. Before. No, uh, well, I, I, I was up here then. You were? I was still in school then. Yeah. Okay. But Russell Emery was a relative, and Earl Lee lived uh, two houses from Oh, he did. In fact, uh, I just want to tell a little story. One night he woke yeah. up and he saw flames that they were reflecting out of the his, out of their chaparral window. And he thought it's his house on fire, and he called the fire department, and it's our house, and it burned down that night. Okay. You mentioned Phil Simons, and uh, you talked about the team that took seven years. Mm -hmm. That was called the Cinderella team. That, that's when I was in high school, and uh, I think our, the record was 15 and 15 that year. We just kept losing everything except for all the tournaments. We won the tournaments each time and went up to the super sectional. I remember walking out with my dad, Norman Reed, walking out the door so excited because we were going uh, to the next game as Champaign to be the first team to play in the new arena hall that they built. And we walked out winning and someone had thrown the ball from the far end and it went in and we lost by one point. And most of us from Heron had already walked out the door to get to our cars. Uh, I want to ask Beverly, uh, Senator, to come up and, and share some of her memories too. 
Wow, she must have done a lot of work on that, huh? And wrote that all down, and that was wonderful. I thank you for sharing that. Mine's not going to be quite that long. I just um, wanted to share a couple of things. Um, I have here a letter that was written by Aline uh, Keener to her family about the uh, games and everything. But first of all, when you were talking about the fire, it reminded me my husband was in high school at that time, attending school, and had to do that. But I was a PK, which is a preacher's kid, and so uh, I, went, I went to church instead of basketball games. But the story was told that with the night the school uh, burned down, W.W. W. Childers was in revival out at the Energy of Baptist Church. And he was talking about all those cheerleaders in their short skirts and that school ought to burn down. And they, the fire engine started going towards the high school. Uh, and, the, and the school actually burned down that night. Uh, whether that was true or not, that, that's a story that was certainly well, Back then, the cheerleaders didn't wear short skirts. Uh, well, they they were, hey, back then it was short to them. <laughs> It had to go to the floor, right? Yeah, well, no, not quite that bad. No, no, the cheerleaders I have always worn pretty, pretty short skirts anyway. But, uh, and my husband also uh, served in the Korean War. Um, and his name was Ray Griffiths, if anyone uh, is not familiar. He also was co-owner in the Heron Bowling Alley, so y'all might be familiar with him out there. But the, the, she, I just went through, and of course she talked a lot about the ticket stuff, and she said uh, that, um, uh, that you simply can't imagine all the confusion, tension, and finagling that was going on at this time with the tickets because of the plan and everything that they uh, come up with to try to uh, get those uh, to go, and uh, they were allowed only so many. And uh, she was also talking about the cold, and, how they stayed in the car, and I guess they must have went to a, a service station or something to get their little snacks or sandwiches or their drinks, you know, and she said from time to time uh, he would start up the car and run the motor and the heater and try to keep uh, everybody warm, you know, and uh, um, so uh, they, it was, she said, down in the 30s, and then we were talking about the gym, and um, it said it was only supposed to seat 3,500, but they figured 5,000 was probably uh, in that uh, gym during those games. And she said, I was sitting and my head was back here between these guys' uh, knees and I had to push a lady off of me to try to, to get up when I needed to get up and leave. And she said it was packed. And so it was uh, 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 pretty exciting for everybody. Uh, to get to go to the game, and um, let me see if I can find that. Said uh, she said it was so cold. She said I can't re remember. I was so cold since Glenn Glenn Young's funeral. So <laughs> that takes her way back, you know, where she had attended his funeral, and it had been pretty cold that day too. Uh, uh, they talked about having to go so early because there was so many lines and so many people in the lines and said uh, he ended up about two or three hundred back and uh, said Orv had uh, developed a catch in his hip and there was a fellow here in town, his name was Herschel Ridgeway. He's crippled and walks with a decided limp. Said Irene knows him. Well, Orv said he was hobbling along trying to run and get in line and Herschel Ridgeway passed him up. <laughs> <laughs> so she had a lot of humor in her letter to her family. And she waited in line about two and a half hours for her tickets and everything. And um, then she talked about uh, coming back to the gym and the lines and the parades and all of that and said, as Big Earl, as the kid sometimes calls, culturally put it Sunday at the welcome rally, the teams and coaches up there didn't know how well balanced our team was. They thought if they could hold Tidwell all the time and Jefferson part of the time, they had us. But when those two can't get many shots off, Willie and Galdoni and Box can score along with the best of them. And I'm going to send you a part of the paper uh, after we beat Mount Vernon, but I want it sent back. <laughs> and then said, um, uh, people didn't get a chance to see what they really could do because they played a magnificent game against Pinkneville, and then Carterville looked even worse. Uh, the Heron boys deserve to win. 
They are such good, mild-tempered boys, and they never got mad or blew up or fussed, and Earl Lee liked the Rock of Gibraltar. He is calm and keeps them calm, and Earl Lee likes the Rock. Uh, he, whoops, I think she repeated herself. He never could have done the same thing with the same team. He's too excitable. So they were all uh, so excited about uh, the team and, and how they won and everything, and, and all that took place and, and all of that. So I'm not going to share all of that. If anybody would like to read her letter, it was very interesting. But uh, as you know, I was a part of the team. Of, um, I was part of the class of 57. And uh, so I have saved a lot of memorabilia over the years for our team and everything. I'd like to interject uh, our uh, two new displays here that we used in September at Sister um, Beverly have prepared those and she has donated those to the Historical Society. Yeah, I, I had uh, done those, um, I think, for like maybe our 40th. Our uh, class uh, likes to have reunions and we have them every five years. And so we just recently uh, had our 55th and um, uh, then went to the Civic Center for that. But I shared this at one of our class reunions. Said no Heron team had done it before and none has done it since. It was 50 years ago, so I guess it was at our 50th uh, reunion that the big team from up north had to reckon with the little team from the south. And the town of Heron was put on the map when the Heron Tigers became the state champs in 1957. Not everyone would get the privilege of attending the playoff games in Champaign as their gym was not large enough back then to accommodate this large crowd. So names were drawn to determine the lucky ones who got to go and were assured a seat. Holding Columbville to its lowest point total of their season, the Tigers shocked the Cahawks with a 45-42 victory and that was a very low score back then. So they were become the first team to oust two unbeaten teams in state final plays. The win was the last state title for a Deep South school through the present. Both sides of Route 148, as there was an old Route 57 back then, they were lined with cars from the radio station, WJPF, north of town, all the way through downtown Heron to greet our state champs upon arrival the next day. And that, that evening, everyone met at the school gym in a show of loyalty and appreciation to their team. Oh yes, the students were all in their seventh heaven and floating on cloud nine the rest of the school year. <coughs> and an event the class of 57 will never forget. And then we had a, um, um, I, I don't know if y'all know Carl Harn. Uh, he was uh, in the class of 58. He and his wife wrote a poem that I think is so excellent. It's called Remembering the 50s. How long ago that seems when we were so young and innocent with all of our hopes and dreams. Downtown was a busy place with businesses galore like Zwick's and J.V. Walker's, Heron Supply and more. Rector, Sons and P.N. Hirsch, Hellenies and B.F.J., Bailey's Bus Stop, Zwick and Goldsmiths. Well, most aren't around today. <coughs> In the middle of Park Avenue, the Doughboy once stood tall. Well, he was moved to the city park. Now he's back next to City Hall. We hung at, out at Teen Town at Bob Brewer's new area dairy, and that's where I worked for Bob Brewer when I was a junior in high school. Nice guy to work for. We loved V. Berry's ice cream, and Camarillo's is legendary. The Chili Mac was famous at the Illinois Cafe, and Polar Whip refreshed us on a hot and humid day. At Marlowe's, I worked there too, and the Annex, <laughs> we watched Marilyn and James Deans on the waterfront, and Giant, Ben-Hur, and the African Queen. Oh, we also went to drive-ins to see our favorite stars. Oh, some people even sneaked in in the trunks of their friends' cars. <laughs> All HTH has been replaced by a beautiful new school, but we still have fond memories of those days when we were cool. Of teachers named Dahanich, Tripp, Benigoni, Carey, Lockwood, and McCollum, Easton, Chap, and Lee. Eckerd was a principal. He wore his pants pulled high. <laughs> and teaching us to drive a school, well, Wallace Baker was the guy. 
There were lots of girls in FHA, while some were, wore letters proudly. Some were in band or GAA, and some girls led their cheers loudly. We had some great athletic teams on the field and in the gym. The undefeated 58 football team were conference champs back then. But our success in basketball with two straight trips to state and a 57 state champ team was nothing less than great. Well, that was then. This is now. Our high school days are done. As we look back, we realized we sure had lots of fun. Heron High will always be a part of each one here. And memories of days gone by may bring a smile or a tear. We mourn our deceased classmates as we celebrate each other. Though for some, though some are gone, our lives go on for one reason or another. So let's raise our glass and make a toast to our dear old alma mater and things that matter most. For those things we recall don't seem so long after all when it's done with classmates and friends. I wanted to make note that um, I bought the book um, that was called 100 Years of Madness, and you see what a large book it is, and yay, 57 basketball team is mentioned in this book, so that was nice to have. And I have a lot of um, things up here on the basketball team and things if anybody would like to come and share those. At this time, do we have anyone in the audience that has some memories they'd like to share? Not? Well, uh, I only had articles that were from the paper office. But what I wanted to say was there was a mention of the Pyramid Tournament. That was a traveling trophy. And you had to win it three years in order to keep the trophy. If you didn't win it, then pass to a different school or then. That was kind of an interesting thing, and not all the names, but it was a, a little interesting way of doing it. The other one I wanted to mention was that uh, autograph picture. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we, in the fall we had the, the team members back, and there was an attempt to get them to autograph those pictures. And uh, we had, I think, five or six players that did autograph them, but the there was a point there where we ran out of autograph pictures and uh, we noticed that outside the uh, Civic Center we had a number of players still standing there. So Philip went out and asked them if they would mind coming back in and signing additional copies. And uh, Box and Galdoni and Tidwell uh, and Lindsay all came back in and sign more so that we have extra copies for the association. So that was very nice. Yeah. Uh, I want to uh, invite everyone to come back for refreshments back here. And I want to thank you all for coming out on a winter's day. And uh, right now we're not sure who the March speaker will be, but there's been a, a, a couple of people that showed some interest, so we'll try to get that out in the next newsletter if if we have someone. As you uh, all know, these uh, uh, historic lectures that we put on are by volunteers uh, when someone um, feels like uh, they're ready to tell us. And we're uh, so fortunate now that the Heron Library has been uh, filming these lectures. and. Uh, so if you know anyone that wasn't here that would like to know about it a little later on, it'll be recorded down on a, on a CD and uh, they can uh, get that from the library. Uh, for the past year, most of our programs have, have been uh, recorded. The, the one uh, from uh, September at the Civic Center with the Civ Ball team, I think that's, I don't know if that's something ready to be checked out or not yet. but. Uh, uh, we're I'm not to, sure. <laughs> we're trying to get all all that down. That's that's part of our purpose. That's the uh, is getting the hearing history in and uh, 
uh, we even have a few people who have done some fireside chats that have been recorded that uh, everyone's welcome to. I think Sam Stotler has, and Ed Goodwin, and uh, Louis French. And French. French. Mm -hmm. No? Um, I might tell you how we named the Pyramid Tournament. Sure. We were sitting at the supper table, and back then your local paper came in the afternoon. So we were looking at the paper while we finished supper. And um, Glenn has always said that I could, he could take me out in the backyard and turn me around a few times, and I wouldn't be able to find my house. <laughs> and that's true. Directions mean nothing to me. If I don't have a map or have it written down, I'm lost. But anyway, we were trying to come up with a name, and um, the paper said that they had already had quite a few names turned in. And uh, I said, well, Glenn, I don't know anything about naming stuff. He said, well, come up with some stuff. You, you, you're smart. And uh, we came up with some things, and we didn't like them, so we just dismissed it. And finally, he said, I've got it. The Pyramid Tournament. Well, he had taken a, a, a map. He worked enough in his town around it. He knew which one was at the top, and it made a pyramid. So that's how he got made. Wow. And he wouldn't turn it in, so I did. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, going through high school, you know, I, I went on about every time anything was played, and there was always that pyramid turn of thing. And I had no idea until today. Is that right? No, that got there. Uh -huh. yeah. That's it. So, we've learned a lot today. Mm -hmm. uh, Emily, Beverly, we thank you so much for sharing I'm your sorry, memories so with uh, one of Heron's proudest days. I know so, there's another thing uh, Heron's known for, we get a lot, but but uh, I, I really I really like focusing on the 57 because that that's our day of glory. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was one other thing I was going to say about John Tidwell. He had not been back to Heron oh, 40 right. years uh, when he came to this yeah, basketball thing uh, at the I think that was thing. Uh, and yeah. um, he, he had only come to one of our class reunions. But when I talked to him when he left, he said, I think he enjoyed it so much, he said, I will be back. Good, so. good. Well, it's... Uh, um, this has been good, and uh, we got some hot water back there. There's some tea. We got cookies, pretzels, and candies, please. Enjoy. Yes, I know. Oh, look at your table. Oh, you sponge is playing with like Cinderella. I would crave it too. The students on the bus? No, my parents.